Hi, I'm Kenny Yates. Welcome to Hold the Hope. And this is our regular weekly message. And today we have a special mini series. It's a two part mini series entitled Yom Kippur. The first one, this first message here, is entitled The Institution of the Day of Atonement. Tomorrow, Monday, September the 25th, 2023, is Yom Kippur, otherwise known as the Day of Atonement. It is arguably the most holy, the most solemn of all the Jewish feasts. Even those Jews who are not particularly religious will attend religious services, or at the very least, they will discuss the Torah. They'll talk about the Torah with their family, with their friends. In times gone past, when the temple in Jerusalem still existed, the high priest would enter the Holy of Holies, but he could only enter it once a year at this time, the time of the Day of Atonement. And he couldn't just enter it, he couldn't go into the Holy of Holies without the blood of a bull and a ram as a burnt offering, and then again with the blood of a goat. The high priest would select two goats and he would cast lots over both goats. One lot would fall to the goat for the Lord. The other would fall to the goat that was presented to Azael. The goat for the Lord would be used as a sin offering. The goat for Azael, he would, the high priest would confess the sins of Israel over it and then he would send it out by a man specially prepared for the job and that man would take this goat out into the wilderness and he would let it go with all the descents of Israel on that, the head of that goat. And in this way, the high priest would atone for the sins of Israel or make atonement for the sins of Israel. That second goat was known as the scapegoat. And in this way, with the blood of goats and bulls, the high priest would atone for all the sins of Israel for another year. You see, those, the blood of those animals did not take away the sin. It would only roll the sin over for another year because it's no way that the sin of the world could be taken away by the blood of goats and animals. It had to be a pure sacrifice. And Jesus was the only sacrifice whose blood was pure and untouched by sin. It, he was sinless. He who knew no sin was made sin. So the blood of Jesus canceled all sin. It took it away. But during that time, the biblical times, the sins of Israel would be attuned for by the blood of goats, of bulls, and it was only once a year on the Day of Atonement. In these days, the temple no longer exists in Jerusalem. So the Jewish people depend on good works to atone for their sins. For example, as I understand it, the rabbis teach that on Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year, the Book of Life and the Book of Death are both opened. And God writes the names of those who are righteous in the Book of Life, and they're allowed to live. And those who are wicked, He writes their names in the Book of Death, and they will die. The 10 days leading up to Yom Kippur are known as the Days of Awe. During these 10 days of awe, the Jewish people will volunteer for charities. They would volunteer for good works. They will give monetarily to charities and they will be nice to people, even people they have not been getting along with over the past year. Even people that had a big falling out with, they will make amends, they will come together, they will act for forgiveness, they will talk it over with each other so that they can make amends 
for past sins, the sins of the past year. And in this way, the Jewish people will hope to do good deeds, that their good deeds would outweigh their bad deeds. And their name then will be written in the book of life on Yom Kippur. The problem with that though, because all of that sounds really good, but the problem with that is that they are now relying on works. And the scripture states that it is not by works that any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 9. See, there's nothing that we can do as people. There's nothing that we can do as sinners to atone for the sin. We cannot get forgiveness through works. It's only by grace, the grace of Almighty God through the blood, the shed blood of Yeshua, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God that our sins are atoned for. Jesus is the only a sacrifice that is acceptable to God. It is only by the finished work of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, on the cross of Calvary, that we are saved and our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So let us see how this feast was celebrated in biblical times. And next week, we'll talk about how it was fulfilled by Jesus, this feast, how it was fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Remember, when Jesus was here on earth, he said that he came, not to, 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 to discount the law, but to fulfill the law according to Matthew chapter 5 verse 17. So everything that he did, he did it in order to fulfill the law and he had to do everything according to the law because all of that was a shadow of the good things to come, mainly our redemption. Jesus is the only propitiation for sin that is acceptable to God who gives us life through his redemptive work on the cross through the blood that he shed for us. Because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So let us get right into our scripture reading for today. It's Leviticus chapter 23, verse 26 through 32. And it says, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the tenth day of this seventh month is the day of atonement. It shall be for you a time of holy convocation, and you shall afflict yourselves and present a food offering to the Lord. And you shall not do any work on that very day, for it is a day of atonement, to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. For whoever is not afflicted on that very day shall be cut off from his people. And whoever does any work on that very day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall not do any work. It is a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, and you shall afflict yourselves. On the ninth day of the month, beginning at evening, from evening to evening shall you keep your Sabbath. The Day of Atonement is celebrated on the tenth day of the seventh month. Beginning at sundown on the ninth day to sundown on the tenth day of the seventh month. Because the Jewish day starts at sundown the previous day because they're on a lunar calendar while we are on a solar calendar. Now, I want you to understand that the number 10 is the number of covenant, meaning that this, these feasts celebrated on the 10th, it marks the, the, the number of covenant. is a covenant between God and the people who are being saved the Christians, the believers, those who have committed their lives to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not for anybody, it's not for the whole world. The whole world, sure, can, can uh, 
be a part of it if they accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. But if they do not accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, they're not a part of it. It's only for the believers, those people who have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. It's a covenant. And that's why it's on the 10th. The seventh month, seven is the number of completion. This is the last of the feasts of the Jewish year. And with them, the Moed, the appointed times of the Lord are completed. They're fulfilled because seven is the number of completion. There are no more feasts for the year after that. Everything is finished at this time. The Day of Atonement is the only day of the year that the high priest was allowed to enter the Holy of Holies. That is behind the veil, behind the curtain that separated the holy from the most holy. I want to unpack chapter 16, the Day of Atonement, and the instructions that God gave to Moses. Leviticus chapter 16, verse 1 through 4. The Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they drew near before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place, inside the veil, before the mercy seat that is on the ark, so that he may not die. For I will appear in the cloud over the mercy seat. See, what had happened was that Nadab and Abihu, the two eldest sons of Aaron, took their censers and put fire in it and laid incense on it and offered unauthorized fire before the Lord, according to Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1 through 3. See, they weren't supposed to do that. God had told the Israelites not to offer unauthorized incense on it. They were not to burn offerings on it. Neither were they supposed to offer green offerings on this altar of incense. They were not even supposed to pour out a drink offering on it. It was only incense to be burned on it. And only in the morning, first thing in the morning, and the last thing at night only twice a day. So they couldn't offer incense on it whenever they want. That was considered unauthorized fire. And that was offensive to God. God expected his priests to be obedient. You can find all of that in Exodus chapter 30, verse nine. Now God is telling Aaron that he is not to go into the holies of holies anytime he wants. It's not his prerogative whenever he go beyond the veil or go through the veil or go into the veil, into the holy of holies where the mercy seat of God is, where his presence dwell. He was not allowed to just go there whenever he feel like it because that veil was not opened up to us as yet. There was still a separation because of sin. There was nothing. The blood of those bulls, those, those goats, was not able to, 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 to bring us back into fellowship or, or into right standings with Almighty God. It was only through the blood of Jesus. So this veil was still in place. It was a thick veil. They, they tell us it's like, it was like six inches thick. So this veil separated us from the very presence of God. And only the high priest, nobody else in all the congregation, in all Israel, not even the Levites or, or the priests, only the high priests and him only once a year and only with blood. So God is telling Aaron that he can't just come in to the Holy of Holies anytime he wants. There's a prescribed time for you to come, Aaron, for you to come into my presence. I will allow it only once a year when God himself would open the veil and let him come in. And then you can't come anyhow you want. Here is the prescribed way for you to come. It's the Day of Atonement. 
that you are allowed to come. And this is the way. Let us look at verse 3. But in this way, Aaron shall come into the holy place with a bull from the herd for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. See, according to the book of Hebrews, Jesus did not enter with the blood of goats, with the blood of rams, and with the blood of bulls and goats, but with his own blood. His blood was sinless. His blood was pure. So he could use his own blood. The all-sufficient blood of Jesus Christ was enough. He then could go in to the Holy of Holies. His blood was the only atonement that not just covered, but took away the sins of the, of the world. It was washed white, so to speak. Praise the Lord for his all-sufficient blood. Verse four, he shall put on the holy linen coat and shall have the linen undergarment on his body. And he shall tie the linen sash around his waist and wear the linen turban. These are the holy garments. He shall bathe his body in water and then put them on. And he shall take from the congregation of the people of Israel two male goats for his sin offering and one ram for a burnt offering. So the first thing that the high priest was instructed to do is to bathe his body in water. And then he was to put on the holy linen garment. The symbolism here is baptism. And that is why Jesus told John when he went down to John the Baptist at the river Jordan to be baptized by him. John did not want to baptize Jesus, but Jesus said, John, let it be so now. And John say, no, Lord, I need to be baptized by you. Yet you come to me to be baptized. And Jesus said, we need to fulfill all things. All things need to be fulfilled. So let this be so now. So John submitted and he baptized Jesus. When Jesus came out of the water, the Holy Spirit descended on him and then was, went into the desert, into the wilderness for 40 days. So what Jesus, the high priest, this, this all is a symbolism. This is a shadow of the things to come. Because I want you to notice this. The next thing that the high priest did was he had to take off his garments, right? His priestly garments. This priestly garment was of one seam. It didn't have any seams in it. It was one, one whole thing, which made it very expensive. Then the second thing is, is that it had 12 precious stones mounted on it. It had gold cords on it and gold woven into it. And it was a very, very expensive expensive garment that the high priest was dressed in. He had to take off that expensive garment and he had to put on a simple linen garment. That is a foreshadow of Jesus setting aside his holy high priestly garment, namely his Godhead. He set aside being God and he became man and he dwelt among us. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Like John said, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The scene was in the beginning with God. And Zechariah chapter three, and we don't really have time to get into all of this and, and unpack that, but Zechariah chapter three speaks of Joshua, the high priest. And Joshua, the high priest, is a typology or a type of Christ. See, Joshua standing before the angel of the Lord and the angel of the Lord commanded that they put on new garments on Joshua the high priest, clean, pure vestments, the scriptures tells us. And then Zachariah said, also a, 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 a turban for his head. And so the angel of the Lord commanded that a turban be put, a place 
on the head of Joshua, the high priest. So the verse, though, these two verses is the two verses I want to draw your attention to. Zechariah chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch, that's speaking of Jesus, the Messiah. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. This is a prophecy about Jesus, about Jesus removing the iniquity of the land in one single day. What day would he be speaking of? That day is the day of atonement. In that day, every sin was removed. You can even say that Jesus himself made that prophecy because Joshua was standing before the angel of the Lord who spoke that prophecy. The angel of the Lord is Jesus in the Old Testament. On to verse 6. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. As I said, there was no need for Jesus to do this. So Jesus skipped this, this step. He didn't have to offer the blood of a bull for any sin because he had committed no sin. There was no sin found in Jesus. He had no sin. So he offered his own blood as atonement for his house, for his people, for his family, us. Verse 7. Then he shall take the two goats and set them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of Medan. And Aaron shall cast lots over the two goats, one lot for the Lord and the other lot for Azazel. Two things I want to point out to you here. One, Jesus himself served as the two goats. One of those goats, the scapegoat, was not Barabbas. I understand that Jesus was taken instead of Barabbas. Barabbas was set free. Jesus was sentenced to death. But Barabbas was not that scapegoat. You see, listen to me. Jesus, although re uh, Barabbas, although released, Jesus, although condemned, could not have been taken the place of that scapegoat because the sins of the world was laid on that scapegoat. The sins of the world was not laid on Barabbas. It was laid on Jesus. Barabbas might represent us, the people, the sinners, the world because we went free we went free but it does not represent the scapegoat that second goat that Aaron the high priest laid his hands on and put the sins of Israel on no that was Jesus himself Barabbas represented us we went free although we were wicked although we were evil we were guilty of all the sins that Jesus was accused of. We were guilty of that. We went astray. We deserved death. But Jesus died in our place. And so Jesus is that second goat, that scapegoat. Because he who knew no sin became sin. Why? Because the sin, as I said, was placed on him. Just like the sin was placed upon the scapegoat and sent away into the desert. Number two, the second thing I want you to, to realize is that Azazel is not a demon. It's not even Satan. God does not instruct us to sacrifice to demons. He does not instruct us to sacrifice to Satan. He doesn't instruct us to sacrifice to any other God except to the one true God, which is he himself, he is the only God that we are to sacrifice to. Therefore, Azazel cannot be a demon goat God receiving one of the sacrifices on the day of atonement. No, it cannot be. So, someone said, if Azazel is not a who, then what 
is Azazel, Brother Kenny? Well, Azazel is a place, a place where the presence of God is not. And that is foreshadowed by the wilderness where, where they led that scapegoat, where they turned him loose. It is a place where the presence of God is not as the, the wilderness depicts it. It depicts a place where nothing grows, nothing it lives, nobody is there. It's void of any type of life. And this is Azazel. It's where the presence of God is not. But we'll discuss that in more detail in our next message, part two. Verse nine, and Aaron shall present the goat on which the lot fell for the Lord and use it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell for Azazel shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement over it, that it may be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. Aaron shall present the bull as a sin offering for himself and shall make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall kill the bull as a sin offering for himself. Well, we, we've already covered that. We said that there was no reason for Jesus to enter into the Holy of Holies with the blood of that bull for his own sins because he had no sins. There was no sin found in Jesus. Therefore, there was no need for this. He offered his own blood for the sins of us sinners, sins of the world. Anyone who is willing to come to Jesus to receive life, Jesus will give life because he shed his blood one for all, one time. And that's the reason why it was the high priest was only allowed to go into the Holy of Holies once a year on the day of atonement because Jesus will only die one time and that one time is sufficient to save the whole world. He shed his blood one time and that's sufficient to save the whole world. So whomsoever will, let him come and receive life. Jesus will freely give life. So Aaron was to kill this bull. He was to use the bull as an offering to make atonement for his sins and the sins of the world. Then he was to get these two goats and he was to cast lots over these two goats. One goat would be presented to the Lord as a sin offering. The other goat that the Lord fell to would be sent away into the wilderness to Azazel. And so, since we covered all of that already, I want us to focus on the next few verses, starting at verse 12. And he shall take its censer full of coals of fire from the altar before the Lord, and two handsful of sweet incense beaten small, and he shall bring it inside the veil and put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of the incense may cover the mercy seat that is over the testimony so that he does not die. I want to show you a mystery here because this could be a little confusing when you read the book of Hebrews, but now it, it will make more sense to you. Because in the book of Hebrews, it says this, Hebrews chapter nine, verse one through five. Now, even the first covenant had regulations for worship and an earthly place of holiness. For a tent was prepared, the first section in which was the lampstand and the table of the bread of the presence. It is called the holy place. But watch this, behind the second curtain was a second section called the most holy place, having the golden altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covered on all sides with gold, in which was a gold urn holding the manna, and Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. Above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Of these things we cannot now speak in detail. Did you notice that? 
the writer said that the golden altar of incense was in the holy of holies. It was inside, behind the veil, inside the veil, in the most holy place. But Exodus chapter 26, verse 31 through 34 says that the only thing that was in the most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant. Then to make it even more clear, Exodus chapter 30 verses 6 through 7 says that the altar of incense was outside in front of the veil in the holy place. Not the most holy place, but the holy place because the high priest would have to burn incense on it every morning and every evening. Therefore, it would be virtually impossible for this altar of incense to be in the most holy place where the high priest could only go but once a year. And the writer of Hebrews says that, that it was inside. Now, if it was inside the holy place, the priest had to burn incense on it every morning. He had to burn incense on it every evening. Daily, twice daily. If it was in the most holy place, he couldn't get to it every, every day because only once a, a year, he was able to go into the most holy place. Therefore, it's impossible for it to be. But after reading Leviticus chapter 16, it makes clear what the writer of Hebrews was saying. We have to read scripture in context with scripture. The writer of the book of Hebrews was talking about the day of atonement where the high priest would take the altar of incense into the most holy place to burn incense on the fire there so that the smoke would go up and it would cover the mercy seat so that he would not die. So that makes a lot more sense now because scripture always interprets scripture. It never contradicts scripture. Scripture never contradicts itself but it interprets itself. Verse 14. And he shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the front of the mercy seat on the east side. And in front of the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. See, the first time that the high priest goes into the most holy place on the day of atonement, it was with the blood of a bull. He took the blood of the bull, he went into the most holy place. He took his finger and he sprinkled some of the blood seven times. Now, again, the seven is the number of completion. It is finished. Seven means it's completed, totally complete. There's nothing else to do. He sprinkled it seven times. The blood of the bull, however, did not take away the sin, but it only covered it. It rolled over the sin of Israel one more year. And the next year, the high priest would have to do it all over again. Understand that God does not force salvation on anyone. It must be a cognizant decision for, for the worshiper on the part of the worshiper to receive the free gift of salvation. Jesus purchased salvation and he offered it to all. But only a few will choose it. Only a few will choose to submit themselves to Jesus Christ and accept his blood as propitiation for, for their sin. Jesus wants you to come. Jesus wants you to accept because the alternative is the lake of fire. He has presented to us life and death. He says, choose life. Choose me that you might live. Choose my blood. I have poured out my blood for many. All you have to do is to come. I did the hard part. I did what you could not do for yourself. Now come and take of me. Take upon yourself my yoke for it is easy, Jesus is saying. He's calling you. He's calling me. He's calling your family. He's calling my family. Come and drink of this free water. This free water of life. I offer it to you. I give it to you. Just come. The alternative, as I said, is the lake of fire or life. Life, eternal life, blissfulness. 
So let me ask you, have you received the free gift of life? If you haven't received that free gift of life that Jesus is offering, you can receive it. Jesus has made it super, super easy for each one of us to receive the gift of life. All you have to do is to ask for it. And the one who asks will receive. The one who knocks, the door will be open. The one who seeks will find. Because Jesus has made it that easy. All you have to do is offer. See, ask. See, Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice for sins. He died for us. And he's beckoning each one of us. Would you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior today? Will you choose life today? Choose to serve the Lord. Now, you can't say that you're serving the Lord and you live any old way. You have to give up those old ways that you used to have. You have to give up what the things that you used to cherish. Sin. Don't cherish sin in your heart anymore. Give it up and serve the Lord. How do I serve the Lord, Brother Kenny? Well, the first thing you have to do is to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior. Once you accept Him as Lord and Savior, He will wash away your sins. How do I do that, Brother Kenny? By saying a prayer of repentance. I can, I can lead you in that prayer right now. Would you pray the prayer with me? Repeat after me. Heavenly Father, forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you. I accept your free gift of salvation. I accept the blood of Jesus right now. Lord Jesus, apply it to my life. Wash away my sins and help me to live for you the rest of my life in Jesus' name. If you pray that prayer, the Lord is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. What I want you to do is to get a Bible. It's so, so important that you read the Bible for yourself so that you would not be fooled, so that you would not be tricked, so that they would not say, here's the Messiah or there's the Messiah, and you'd be fooled because you will know what to look for. Jesus himself, Matthew chapter 24, read Matthew chapter 24 and understand that there's no secrecy in Jesus. We're, we're, we're not going to be snatched away secretly and people are going to be wondering where, where we're going and that aliens have taken us. It's not going to be none of that. They're going to know where we've, where we've gone. So I want you to read the scriptures for yourself. Do not get your theology from movies or from books, but from the only book, the Bible, the Holy Scriptures. Don't mess around with Apocrypha and all of this. Read the Holy Word of God. Meditate on His Scriptures. Then I want you to find a Bible-believing church. One of those churches that says, Thus saith the Lord, Jesus is King. The Holy Spirit still operates in power. Join that church. Be discipled in that church. Learn how to live for Jesus. That church that says there's a right way and the wrong way to live. Join that church. When Jesus comes back, he'll find you doing exactly what it is that you should be doing. He'll say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Then what I want you to do is to learn to pray. Learn to serve him. Learn to be obedient to his, his, his word. He'll wash you, he'll clean you up. And Jesus will be pleased with you. You'll live throughout eternity with him when he comes back to get us. And that's what we're all working towards. That's what we're all looking forward to, to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. I want to say thank you so much for joining us. Join us next week for this for the conclusion of this message and how Jesus fulfilled the day of atonement. I'm Kenny Yates. This is Hold the Hope. Be blessed and stay blessed.